Okay, in this video, I'd like to begin my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number one, and I'm going to discuss Coulomb's Law. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. If you'd like to find out what news or updates or what videos or whatever I'm posting, you can also follow me on Twitter at adambeatty503. So, I'd like to discuss Coulomb's Law. The previous video to this is actually from a different set of videos altogether. It's called Vector Calculus for Electromagnetism. And I'd like you to look at number five, which I discuss, or where I discuss, the separation vector. That's very important for, uh, for in general, for your electrostatics. So, where do we go from here? Now, we, we go from here by defining what Coulomb's Law is, first of all. So I'm just going to go, um, I'm going to go straight out and write it. So F is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 small q, large q, a separation to be squared, and a separation unit vector. Right, that's it. Now, I'm not really going to, I'm not going to get deep into that yet. So, in electrostatics, we're dealing with the following. We have two different types of charges. We have uh, source charges, and we have test charges. So, how do we define what the difference is? So source charges produce they, they produce the, uh, the electric field. Now I know I haven't discussed the electric field so at the moment if you want you can think about it. The source charges produce something which we call the electric field. The test charges, the experience the ex they experience the electric field F-I-E-L-D. So that's why we say they test it, because depending on how strong their experience is, or how weak their experience is, they are testing the electric field. Now we have the following, we say, placeholders. For sources, we talk about a little q, and for, uh, for tests, we talk about a large q. So q is the placeholder in general for charge. And little q, in this case, we'll talk about source charges, and large q will talk about test charges. Now, it doesn't say anything about the parity or the, whether or not it's positive or negative. So, from now on, if you see minus q, we'll know talking about a negative charge. Plus q, you're talking about a positive charge. Now, where do we get negative charges? In general, if we talk about negative charges, we're talking about the electron. Okay? But then you might ask yourself, well, what about positive charges? To be honest, I don't really want to get into that because if we're, we're, down, we're down the road there getting into nuclear, nuclear physics and I don't want to do that. What, we want, what I would like you to do is accept that there are different types of charges, positive and there are negative charges. Okay, the next thing we need to discuss is the, their separation. Okay, so let's say if I put, let's say if I put a, a charge Q, this is my source charge and this here, large Q, is my test charge. So my source charge is, is producing what I'm after saying is the electric field, and my test charge, large Q, is experiencing it. Now, I'm going to tell you that there, the force is a vector, and it's in the direction from small Q to large Q. So why is that important? Well, what that means is the following. It means the force is, if, if for the test charge, the force is in the opposite direction to, to where the, uh, the source charge is. So the, we'll say the test charge is actually being pushed away or it's being repelled from the source charge. But the important point to note here is that we're talking about two positive charges. So clearly if I then swap the, we'll say the parity on one of the charges, the force, because it's a vector, is also going to swap its direction and you'll get the separation vector, or the force, excuse me, pointing for, for in regard to the test charge towards the source charge. So this time we're talking about an attractive situation. So what we're after seeing here is that like charges repel and unlike charges attract, even though I haven't discussed it very well or very in, in, in great depth. If I have two minor, uh, negative charges, once again the force will point in that direction. And if I put a negative charge on the source and a positive charge on the test, we also have uh, well, it might the field would point in a slightly different direction, but it will be attractive either way. All right. So, uh, right next, the separation between the charges is important, and you should 
That should make sense to you because when we're talking about vectors, the distance between, or in general about forces, the distance between um, things is important. So let's just once again define our large or large Q, which is our test charge. So I'm going to call the, the, the separation in space between the source and the test the separation vector. So this is the separation. And notice, of course, that it is a vector. Now, I don't, I have no better phrase to use, but I'm going to call this the squiggle, okay? If you can think of something else, well, then go with it. But it's a vector, so I have to give it this vector notation. By the way, some people like to have the arrow up on top, or they might just have, they might like to have a single line up top. Personally, I prefer, prefer to have a single line down below. Okay, that's just what I do. So, that is our separation vector. And the separation vector points from your source to your test. So, it points like that. Now, what is the definition of the separation vector? I'm going to write it actually in here. So, the separation vector is equal to r minus r prime. Now you might say, well, what is r and what is r prime? So, let's think about, we'll say, our Cartesian coordinate system. We have our x-axis and we have our y-axis. So, every point in space has an associated vector with it. Okay, I'm just going to write, I'm going to write my, my source charge up here. Because if I go from the origin to my source charge, I have a vector, but I'm going to call it or uh, I'm going to call it or prime. And if I go from your or my origin to my test charge, I will also have a vector. I'm going to call it or. And if you look closely, you'll see that in actual fact, my separation vector corresponds to or minus or prime. Now, before we continue, you need, if you're looking at my videos at the very least to note that when I'm talking about primed variables, we're talking about sources. And unprimed variables, we're talking about tests. It's very important, so it's R minus R prime. And the reason that's important is because later on, for example, you might have an integral that might look something like this. And this is important because in this integral, for example, we're integrating with respect to the primed variables or the sources and not the unprimed variables or the tests. Now, so that is my separation vector. Now, how do we get a unit vector? So let's say I have a vector a, and we'll say a, of course, will a is equal to a. If I divide my vector, in this case a, by the magnitude of the vector a, it's going to have a magnitude of 1. So in this case, the magnitude is going to be 1. So the magnitude of that is going to be 1. But it will have a direction because it's still a vector. It's a vector divided by the magnitude of the vector. So its magnitude is going to be 1, but it's going to have a direction. So let's, let's say, for argument's sake, the direction is in the x-axis. So it's going to be one, 1 unit in the x-direction, right? So we call it 1i hat. But because it's got a magnitude of 1, we call it a unit vector, and we put this little hat on top. So i hat is the unit vector in the in the i-direction, the, um, the and what we call the... The, uh, it would say a hat would be a unit vector in the direction of a. So you can see where we're going here, I'm sure if you look at Coulomb's law, that we will often talk about the separation unit vector, which is clearly r minus r prime divided by the magnitude of r minus r prime. That's the separation unit vector. So the reason it's important is it gives us the direction, and the direction in electrostatics or in forces in general is very important because they are vectors. So let's go now and look at Coulomb's law finally. So this here is Coulomb's law. It defines the force which a test charge large Q experiences due to a source charge small Q. Now, looking at the constants in the center, let's ignore those, or excuse me here, we're going to ignore those for the moment. So it, we, we say here that the force is proportional to the magnitude of the test of the source charge is proportional to the magnitude of the test charge and it's inversely proportional to the square of the separation vector so it's an inverse square law it falls off um, with the square of distance so you know Newton's law of gravity also falls off with the square of the of the distance so as a result we can say that f is equal to a constant let's say capital a q 
capital Q over uh, the separation vector to be squared. At the moment, I haven't put in the, the direction. But so let's put it in, in the direction, and we have this separation unit vector to give the direction. Now, what about the constants? I'd like if, for you not to worry about them, because their constants are largely as a result of the, uh, the, the SI unit system. So if you go to another unit, or unit system, you might see different constants. So, yeah, uh, we, we don't worry about them, but it's 1 over 4 multiplied by pi multiplied by epsilon 0. Now, you might say, well, what is epsilon? Epsilon we call the permittivity of free space. So, and we, Well, sorry, epsilon zero is the permittivity of free space. If there is no zero there, we call it what the, the permittivity of a medium. So the permittivity of, of free space is something which measures how well, your, uh, how well your electric field is transmitted. So let's say we have epsilon, that is, that, and let's say, I don't know, it's aluminium. So epsilon for aluminium, it, it measures or it's indication for how well aluminium transmits an electric field. So epsilon zero is how well a vacuum transmits an electric field. It, it is a, a magnitude of 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Now in the, in the, in the SI uh, unit system, of course, the unit is coulomb squared per newton per meter to be squared. All right, very straightforward. And that's put in there. So Later on, we're talking about uh, magnetics or magne magnetostatics. We're going to get mu zero, which is the permeability of free space, and this tells us the how likely your or how easy it is for your material to get magnetized. But that's slightly different. Okay, so why why am I asking you just to accept this law? Why am I not proving it? Well, the reason I'm not proving it is because Coulomb's law is empirical. It as I as I'm aware, it cannot be proved. It just it is it's come from ex experiment. It has it's proven correct as for over I know definitely over a hundred years. It's it's there a long time now at this stage. So um, and clearly it works. So nothing has been changed, and for that reason, um, that nobody has gone near it. But I'm sure maybe quantum electrodynamics is able to prove Coulomb's law. But I'm certainly not going to get that. So I think that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching the video. Please subscribe to my channel, pass it on to your friends, and you might also visit university physicstorials.com.